yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me here. And um, despite this having been planned for three years or so, uh, this is very much, very much work in progress. And I'm very curious to hear what you think um, about my ideas. So yeah, life and literary fiction imagining in different ways. Here is a kind of inspirational quote for this talk. We shouldn't think about life like we think about literary fiction. Uh, the reason is that we follow different values in life and literary fiction, at least when looking into the future. So this sounds kind of, um, you know, banal maybe to you, but of course I will fill it with some specific theoretical uh, assumptions and claims and arguments. Let's see. So this is the structure of what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about imagination, then about creativity, about creative imagining, and my kind of account of creative imagining with minimal, minimal conditions on creative imagining. And then I will talk about different constraints and values in literary fiction and in real life. So maybe the new thing will be to think of um, reading literary fiction as a kind of creative imagining, and then also about uh, thinking about our own life as uh, creative. Of course, not necessarily so, but we can think um, about our life in that way. So first about the imagination. So here are, is, a, is a divide or a division that has been used in the literature. We have instructive, instructive uses of imagination and we have transcendent use of imagination instructive, um, what we mean is uh, when we do thought experiments, when we engage in model thinking, in thinking about the future, um, wherever we're interested in kind of, when, wherever we have epistemic goals, we use this kind of imagining. And this has been in need of defense just because it is um, only recently has been addressed as a, a possibility of exploring this, this use of the imagination. Then there's the transcendent use of imagination. And I think classically, we would say that what we mean here is imagining in response or what has taken a lot of room in this debate on transcendent use of imagination is imagining in response to fiction. And this, of course, is constrained by what is true in the fiction. Um, and what has not um, drawn a lot of attention is creative uses of imagination. Of course, also in the transcendent use of imagination would, would be, um, you know, daydreaming, fantasizing, and so on. So I'm interested in this particular um, use of imagination, creative use of imagination, and this as a kind of transcendent use of imagination. So uh, creative imagining in response to fiction, what kind of imagining am I talking about? We have on the one hand propositional imagination, which has been crucial in the debate on fiction. What is fiction? Well, can be defined or has been defined via propositional imagination, but we also have experiential imagination. And what I'm going to say is that both kind of responses to fiction are a kind of creative use of the imagination. And this sounds, of course, very counterintuitive because, well, um, I, okay, I should write. <laughs> because creativity is not what we associate with reading usually, right? So now on creativity, am I in control? Yeah, sorry, just a second. Yeah, I'm not seeing uh, slides uh, um, uh, at the uh, Oh, I see. Just a moment, we just share the... <laughs> Mm, yeah. Sorry. Okay. So I have to tell you, before I tell you about creative imagining, I have to tell you about creativity, of course. Can, I cannot, this doesn't do anything now. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So what is creativity? Um, contemporary approaches, I'm sorry, there's a typo. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Contemporary <laughs> approaches, it makes sense. Follow more or less Margaret Bowden's uh, definition of creativity as the ability to bring about something that is new and surprising as well as valuable, and to do so through a certain kind of conscious, intentional, and autonomous process. 
So when you look at the definition and how it's being discussed, how creativity generally is being uh, discussed in the literature, we ascribe the value, the novelty and the surprisingness and the fact that creativity seems to require an agent first and foremost to the creative product, such as a scientific theory or a piece of art. So creativity is understood generally as uh, encompassing both the scientific realm and the artistic realm. But I'm, of course, more interested in artistic creativity here. So it has been defined primarily as a feature of a product or at least as necessarily requiring a product. So accounts of creativity that focus on the process of creating also require that there be a product in the end, right? And that makes sense intuitively as well. So creating means to bring something about, something that is new, surprising, and valuable. Um, but that also makes it kind of hard to look at the process in isolation. But possible explanations as to why people have focused on the product is that we can recognize creativity through the product. A scientific theory or an artwork display the agent's creativity. And another explanation may be that creativity has been neglected by philosophers, by philosophers of mind in particular and has mostly been investigated by psychologists. And psychologists, of course, want to measure and test um, creativity, so they need this product to see whether somebody is creative or not. The problem, however, is that not every product displays the um, creativity of an agent anymore, right? Because we have AI creativity. So I asked Chet GPT to give me a very, very short but interesting fictional story about Mar Barcelona, I got five stories about somebody, some girl meeting this mysterious man and spending the night with him. So I, I clicked again and again until Sophia showed up. So she had always dreamt of visiting Barcelona. I mean, I don't have to read the story to you, but Jet, Jet GPT is doing quite well, especially in the end. It says it was then that Sophia realized that the real magic of Barcelona was in the unexpected beauty that could be found around every corner. So the problem is that this is not reliable anymore. We can't just look at the product and know that some creativity is behind it because we wouldn't call what Jet uh, GPT does creative. We may call the products creative in the sense that they're new, surprising, and valuable, but certainly not the process that um, led to this product. So looking at the process. First, um, we can distinguish three, if we follow Borden, and a lot of people have, we can distinguish three different kinds of creativity. There's combinational creativity, exploratory creativity, and, and transformational creativity. So these are different levels of creativity, we can say. So uh, first, a new combination of things. Second, um, a new theory or a new um, concept, concept within a certain conceptual paradigm. And third is um, starting something completely new, for instance, a new movement in, in the art. So um, the question is, does that mean that we have three different processes? Probably not. And we should probably, so here are some reasons why we think of, why we should think of the process as independent of the product so that we don't have to say, you know, different kinds of creativity um, involve different kinds of processes. So sometimes the creating agent is unaware of the context in which something is created and doesn't know what type of creativity their work will result in, though the process should be conscious, intentional, and autonomous, so the artist should know what they are doing, right? And some creative processes simply don't result in creative products at all because the artist gets interrupted, loses interest, or simply fails. But we still want to account for these cases as cases of creativity. We don't have this product. So what could that process be? Um, kind argues, and similarly, Beanie has argued that combining ideas in a new way, the first kind of creativity mentioned by Bowden, this could be the actual activity underlying all kinds of types of creativity. And then we see, depending on the context, the context whether this you now created um, product is, for instance, transformational, it changes something completely, it brings in something completely new. 
Um, Dustin Stokes speaks more generally of cognitive manipulation using the imagination. And of course, here we are back at the imagination. Imagination doesn't aim at truth. It's not well sensitive. It's voluntary. So it's ideal to account for what we're doing when we're creating. So many creativity scholars have argued that imagination plays some role in creativity. So what kind of imagining is involved in creating? Um, artistic creativity, according to Gott, uh, likely involves experiential imagination, while the intellectual is likely to use propositional imagining. So again, we have the divide between artistic creativity and maybe scientific or instrumental creativity. And experiential imagination here means sensory forms of imagination, imagining what it's like and effective or embodied imagining. But imagination is clearly not sufficient for creativity because we have epistemic uses of imagination and imagination is not necessary for creativity because as I have shown to you, um, you know, we, we want to call that story uh, Possibly, we may want to call it creative, but it certainly didn't come about through a creative process and certainly chat, chat GPT doesn't use imagination. But clearly some creative products are the result of imaginative processes. And I want to look at those. So here are three models that can be found in the literature on the role of the imagination in creating. The first is the display model. According to this model, imagination just displays the result of the creative process. And the creative process can be unconscious. For instance, you know, um, as Freud, for instance, said, or even in Plato, you find this account of creativity, the muses, um, well, it's not unconscious, but it's passive. The muses inspire uh, the artist. And then the result gets displayed in the imagination. But there's also the search model. So according to this model, we use our imagination to try out various possibilities. So imagination is, is ideal because we are not committed to anything. So we can just map out various possibilities and then we can judge which one we want to choose. And then we use that uh, for our new idea. And then uh, Michael Beanie has um, argued that actually what God does in this paper in 2003 is defend another, a third model, which is the connection model. Um, according to this model, we bring together different ideas. And this is actually what the creative process is. So the real creativity would seem to lie in making these connections, not in some unconscious process where the result gets displayed in, in the imagination. No, the imagination can actually play a little bit more of an uh, active role in connecting things. So holding together things again, because it doesn't commit us to anything. Um, this uh, vehicle, the imagination is ideal for this process. So you see, these are general models, um, people saying, well, this is the role, no this, no this. But what I want to do is look at these three functions that imagination can take as minimal conditions on a creative process. So here is my suggestion, which I cannot defend in much detail in this talk, because I also want to talk about life. So, But here are three minimal conditions rather than thinking in terms of models. So A, we consciously attend to or reflect on what is being presented or represented through our senses, in memory, in thought, or in the imagination. So again, this is not supposed to be necessarily the process of creating, you know, we maybe we start with A, then we do B, then we do A again. So we consciously attend to something. And this is um, similar. So it takes account of creating as a conscious process. And it is kind of similar to the display function of creativity. So something gets displayed to us and we pay attention to it or reflect on it. Then we intentionally manipulate what is being presented or represented and build connections to other representations, often within constraints. And this is supposed to account for the third model, the connection model. So we take what is being uh, presented to us and in the imagination, we intentionally <clears throat> manipulate what is being presented or represented and we build these connections. And the third condition would be we search for shareable value in, in the attending to manipulating and building of connections between representations. So you saw that I, um, I said the search function, according to God, would be to, to uh, map out all the possibilities and then choose, but then judge which one is the best idea. 
And I'm, I, I think it's crucial to see that this is not what we do in artistic processes, or that's my claim. Rather, the search for the connections is already, um, is, is not neutral, is already guided by value. So I'm not mapping out all the possibilities and then judging. Rather, my search for the good connections and the novelty is guided by my values and by attending to my values. So the search function is not a neutral function to begin with. Rather, our search for connections is, I've just said that, is guided by our attention to and reflection on what we value and what our imagining aims for is value. Both our attention to and reflection on the imagining as well as our manipulation of and connection with other representations are guided by an interest in and search for what we value. Just repeat to make it more plausible, I guess. <laughs> so... Um, and of course, the relevant value here is first and foremost, a subjective value, the, the value of the creator, right? However, and I think this is also crucial, we likely strive when creating, we strive for an objective or at least shareable value, which can somehow be displayed. And this is where we often, at the end of a creative process, have a creative product. But not always, you know, sometimes we fail. Now, and now is the important um, step for... Um, my talk today. So obviously, this is a big, uh, big claims here that need to be defended. But again, I can't do it here. So now what's important for this talk is that the search for value can be a guided search. So when we engage in art, or with art, we still have to see, understand and often build this value. And literary fiction is a very good example because it's a process and we have hopes, wishes, etc. For, for this process. And it's particularly easy to um, see that, that creating can be a guided search. Creating as I understand it, as I presented it to you, can be a guided search. And now I'm going to show you a bit better what I mean. Now it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. So here's a text passage that I wrote in a fictional story that I, I consider a literary story. So uh, the story is about the death of my great grandmother um, in terms of where I learned about this death. At least I thought I learned about this death. Later, it turns out it, she didn't actually die. Somebody else died. But this is now how I imagine um, the death of my great grandmother. So. I'm imagining it in terms of the cellar that I learned it at, the preserved fruit that I saw there, the pain in my feet, etc. So I'm reading this passage to you. The shock and incomprehension about the nature of her death lie raw in the, and by the way, it's in German in original, so I'm not saying this is literary. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, sorry about that. Lost in translation, I guess, the literary bit. The shock and incomprehension about the nature of her death lay raw, lie raw in the cellar of my house, where the mason jars with preserved cherries and quince jam were kept. The dirty glasses in the dirty cellar, the rubbing and crunching of the pebbles under my feet, the pricking of the pebbles in my feet when I wasn't wearing shoes, and the red rubber rings with the straps you had to pull at to open the jar. As I ate, I stared at the red rubber band, at the straps, at the mold that had sometimes formed on the edge of the glass, and at the unscathered dark cherries in the lighter juice. So now, of course, I came up with these connections, let's say. I, I came up with seeing the death or understanding the death or imagining the death of my great-grandmother in terms of these fruit and the cellar and the contrast between the, you know, the, the preserved fruit and the dirt in the cellar and the pain in my feet and the pain about her death. But the reader, you as the reader, you still have to understand, see, feel, construct, and so on, these values. And you may not, you know, this may not subjectively please you aesthetically, and then you don't go along. And I would say what you deny then is this guided creative process. But if you go along, you make these connections, and you see the value in them. And this, how, this is how I would say you search for value, but of course you do it in a very guided way, but you still have to do it. And that's why it meets my um, definition of creative imagining. So now you see how imagining the truths in fiction, 
here and the imagining partly constrained by truth and fiction, which is the experiential imagination, are creative uses of imagination, though very much guided. Now I want to talk about constraints. How am I doing in time? Oh, totally fine. Good. So here are the conditions again, so I can go through them again. So we consciously attend to or reflect on what is being presented or representing through the senses in memory, in thought, or in the imagination. So you have to somehow attend to what I'm writing, you know, how, how you're imagining it or you, how you're hearing it in order to make these connections and in order to value them. And then you go along with me intentionally manipulating what is being presented or represented and to build these, in this case, not manipulating, but that, that was more my work, but you build these connections between the cherries and the great grandmother and the dirty cellar and the mold. And the creator does it often within constraints, but if you're just reading, obviously you're just following the constraints. And you search with me for shareable value in the attending to manipulating and building up these connections. Now let's talk about uh, thinking about life. So we can think about, you know, we can imagine and think. I'm using think as a more neutral term to, to imagining, but I defined creative imagining so you know what I mean by it. And I can use thinking um, maybe more neutrally. So Think about the following thoughts. Um, my great grandmother, no, my grandmother right now is in, in an old age home and I can think about what is left of her life, right? I can think about her in this home and how many months or maybe years she still has to live. Then I can think about whether I should support my friend in a certain decision or rather tell her that I disapprove of her decision. So this is thinking about the present and about the future. Then thinking about the past, I can think about how a person I didn't get along with uh, was murdered. And I can think about my great grandmother's death. Now, the main difference when I think about these is about these topics, let's say, is that we don't usually follow in our thinking and in our action, uh, actions aesthetic values or values concerning the structure of events in life. So here, when thinking about my grandmother, I'm not thinking, you know, what today would be a good day to die because um, it's raining and she always loved the rain and maybe that makes her death or her life. Uh, good. Okay, that's a stupid, it just came spontaneously to me, <laughs> maybe not a great example. Um, but let's say on the birthday of her husband, that would be a nice day to, to, to die. I mean, I can think like this, and it's kind of okay. But you know, I should think about whether she wants to live and how long she still wants to live and whether she's still happy living in, in this old uh, um, age home. So I should take different um, aspects into consideration when I think about her, my grand grandmother's life. Then when, um, when I think about what to do, well, I should think about my friend first and foremost, um, whether it would be good for her to tell her that I disapprove of her decision. And I shouldn't think so much about the drama that may uh, happen if I don't tell her, for instance. Thinking about the past, it's a little bit different. As you saw, I made this story about my great grandmother, which was a story of my life into, a, I, I turned this into a literary text, right? And it's fine, I think, because it's in the past. I don't have to take the concerns um, of my great grandmother into account anymore. Well, maybe I, I should respect her dignity and things like that, but that's, that's something different. Um, I think thinking about the past, I'm much less constrained and I can, follow different values when imagining about life. So compare in literary text, it's absolutely fine uh, to hope that someone will die because it fits their life to die in this way. Um, not at all uh, in the case of, well, some sometimes harmless cases, I can think about it in real life, but this actually was also a, a friend I didn't get along with, uh, was recently murdered. 
and it's absolutely i'm sorry for that for, for these examples but it's absolutely you know there is, i'm very constrained in how i can think about this death i shouldn't think about it like she was a fictional character and it was you know i can't be relieved about her death i simply can't Wanting something bad to happen for more drama is absolutely acceptable, of course, uh, in the case of fiction. And enjoying the pain of others, I put others in quotes, mm -hmm. while comfortably sitting in an armchair is also absolutely okay. But sometimes we do follow aesthetic values when thinking about life, especially when looking back at what has happened. We sometimes and very often about our own life, you know, connect unrelated life events. We see events in terms of other events. And we see causal relation that aren't really causal relations. We see events as symbols of other events. So I think that we often apply this kind of creative thinking that I defined when trying to make sense of our own life. And then it turns into something like a literary, uh, a little bit of a literary text. And that is okay. Um, but what we're guided to imagine in literary fiction is constrained by the rules and values of the genre, of course, and by what the author values. And these are mostly aesthetic values, but how we think about life is constrained by many other things as well, how the world is, how our past is, what is possible in the future, what our values in life are, and of course, the concern for others. So this was very, very um, scattered and sketchy, I know, but... Um, here is a quote again, we shouldn't think about life like we think about literary fiction. The reason is that we follow different values in life than in literary fiction, at least when looking into the future. And now you understand what I meant by follow. In our imaginative process, we follow values, I think. And in the case of life, sort of the moral or broadly ethical values are um, kind of trumping the aesthetic values very often, right? We can follow aesthetic values when creatively thinking about our past more so than about our future and about ourselves more so than about others, I think. So this, I said, sounds a bit banal, but what's new is that thinking about life as creative, imagining under constraints. Um, I tried to defend this a little bit and that creative imagining is following values. Here's the conclusion. Reading literary fiction involves guided creative imagining. Creative imagining is, among other things, to follow in the imagination some values. These values can be different when we think about real life and when engaging with literary fiction, mostly due to ethical concerns in the broad sense in real life. And the constraints are different in life and in literary fiction. And that was it. Thank you very much.